The Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing entitled STEM and Computer Science Education, Preparing the 21st Century Workforce. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today we will discuss several initiatives in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, and computer science education, and how a variety of organizations engage students in these important fields. A STEM-educated workforce is necessary for innovation and for ensuring U.S. economic strength, competitiveness, and national security. As demand for skilled STEM workers continues to grow, the U.S. must work to fill those employment needs, especially with the looming retirements of the baby boomer generation. In addition, there remains a critical cybersecurity workforce shortage as cyber attacks are increasing in both quantity and complexity. The results from a 2017 Global Information Security Workforce Study predicts a worldwide shortage of 1.8 million cybersecurity professionals by 2022. Also, according to CyberSeq, 40,000 jobs for information security analysts go unfilled every year in the U.S., and employers are struggling to fill 200,000 other cyber-related jobs. I know uh, just in my uh, district, we hear about thousands um, in, in Virginia at large, you know, thousands and thousands of cyber jobs that are going unfilled. And this is one of the most you know, competitive areas where we know we could use more employees and students. And there are a lot of innovative programs going on trying to get students into that pipeline. It's a privilege to serve in an area of Virginia where I do, which so many of my constituents are those talented people who work on cyber issues at so many of our companies, whether it's Northrop Grumman or Capital One um, or small startups like FishMe, and there, and there are so dozens of others. I don't mean to, I'm leaving out. <laughs> we have some here today, and I could go on and on with the um, hundreds that we have addressing these, but those are just some of the few that I've been able to visit and see um, a lot of their cybersecurity workforce in action. But whenever I visit these companies and constituents who work in this sector, a repeated concern is expressed to me in increasing the need for the individuals with the appropriate education, training, and knowledge of cybersecurity matters and how important it is that we get that pipeline you know, from, we know, from grade school now, we know, getting that working. So there are great examples of uh, local companies working to fill these workforce gaps. In um, Ashburn, Virginia, in my district, we have Telos, which is both working with our local high school, Monroe Technology Center, which provides cybersecurity certificates so kids can start working right out of high school on these much needed jobs. And again, getting into that pipeline, having employers often who will then pay for their college degree as well as their benefits and salary while they're going through school as well as George Washington University's Science and Technology Campus, which also is not just here in DC, but also in Loudoun County. Um, yesterday, I attended an event right here in the Capitol uh, with Girls Who Code, and it's a summer program which provides young women experience in computer-related fields and sets them on a path towards acquiring these important skills that will be, as we know, so much needed in the 21st century workforce. Um, we know there are not enough women in those fields, and Girls Who Code is one of those exciting programs that's capturing the imagination of these young people in high school and even earlier to get them on that path. Um, Capital One, as I mentioned, which is headquartered um, in my district, um, also exposes middle school students to technology by partnering with schools and community leaders to inspire the students to focus on software engineering. Uh, since it was launched, their program had over 2,500 participants who have created, created over 500 different mobile apps. Additionally, Micron, who's here today, has a sizable facility in Manassas in my district, which commits STEM-focused grants and partners with Virginia universities to help inspire our students. They're also partnered with Discover Technology to create their new STEM mobile discovery lab, a bus which is specifically designed with interactive science exhibits where students are able to work with robotics and explore 3D printing. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that work 
uh, that they are doing during these hearings. And I also wanted to thank them for recently coming to my Young Women's Leadership Program, where they were also promoting one of our uh, programs where we um, were privileged to have uh, a number of members from NASA promoting the STEM fields and an astronaut who came to speak to the girls. So it was one of our best attended events, and, and we were happy to promote the bus there. While these examples are encouraging, we know there's so much more we need to do to educate and train our current and future workforce. The workforce gap is especially uh, troubling when considering the many hearings we have held in this committee on federal cybersecurity issues. These hearings focused on cybersecurity incidents as well as emerging risks which threaten federal agencies' computer networks and hundreds of millions of Americans who entrust their confidential and personal data to these agencies, but also their personal data that's in their everyday work, whether in their banks and, and um, you know, in every part of our, our life. In order to fill these jobs, we must be able to harness the talent of our nation's um, young men and women. Um, when it comes to women, we, it's estimated that only 3% of these jobs um, often are filled by women. That is why we passed here um, with, uh, I think it was unanimous here on the committee, the Inspire Women Act, which was signed into law earlier this year. This bill leverages NASA's talent pool of current and retired astronauts and other career professionals and early career female scientists, engineers, and innovators to inform and inspire young women to pursue their dreams in STEM subjects. Through the combination of public and private sector investments, we can help inspire our students to get into these programs early and to stay, to capture their imagination, to help them, them and their parents understand that this is you know, very much needed in our workforce, but also very exciting areas which can pretty much take them into any field that they may be interested in. So with that, I look forward to hearing the testimonies of our witnesses. Uh, so thank you, and I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Comstock, and uh, thank you, and uh, Chairman Smith, for holding this hearing today. This is an issue that's very uh, important to me, very close to my heart. I want to thank all the witnesses for, for being here today also. Uh, well, for the past eight-plus years, I have had the privilege of serving as first chair and then ranking member of this subcommittee, which was formerly the Research and Science Education Subcommittee before we merged with the Technology Innovation Committee. And I've also, during that time, been co-chair co of the uh, STEM Ed Caucus, and we've done a lot of work in this area, but a lot more still needs to be done. You know, my experiences here in Congress combined with my background in engineering. Uh, my wife uh, was a uh, math major and has taken that into uh, her, her career. Uh, it's all given me a lot of insight into the importance of, of STEM education for the success of individuals in today's job market, but also for the success of our nation's economy. Now, I'm not as well versed in computer science as in uh, STEM ed, but I do know I spent a lot more time in the 90s as a political science grad student, a lot more time doing computer programming then than I did in the 80s as an engineering undergrad. Uh, the importance of computers, computer programming, has just over the last four decades continued to, to mushroom. And it's just critically important in so many jobs today, so I'm really glad that we're, we're holding this hearing today. Computers, we all know, are becoming more and more integral to our, our daily lives. Uh, uh, device we carry in our, in our pockets, we can video chat with loved ones, order groceries, or even watch a live stream a congressional hearing like this one. Looking at the future, artificial intelligence, mixed reality, and an Internet of Things will undoubtedly play larger roles in, in our everyday lives. Obviously, none, none of this is possible without computer scientists and individuals with computer skills. The innovations coming out of Silicon Valley are inspiring, but industries beyond the technology sector are also integrating computer science and data analytics into their business models. With this increased reliance on in computing and information technology, the workforce demand for computing and programming experience has skyrocketed. Code.org estimates there are over half a million open computing jobs nationwide. As we talk about where are the jobs, that's a place where we have all these jobs that are unfilled. That means we are missing a lot of economic value. 
This hearing is a great opportunity to discuss challenges and opportunities for producing a workforce equipped to meet the demand for computing expertise. The National Center for Education Statistics reports that a record number of computer science bachelor's degrees were awarded in 2015. Colleges and universities are strained to expand their capacity to accommodate the surge in student interest, but we're obviously still not producing enough skilled computer science scientists. So we want to know what we can do to address this problem. There are also barriers at the high school level to providing access to high quality computer science courses. According to a 2016 research study by Gallup and Google, only 40, only 40 percent of schools teach computer programming. Computer science curricula vary from school to school. It's only 10 states have created K through 12 computer science standards. Increasing the pool of qualified teachers has also proven to be a very difficult challenge. I'm encouraged to see that each year more schools are offering computer science courses, allowing students to count them toward credit for graduation. In fact, last year, the Chicago Public School System became the first in the country to add computer science to the list of requirements for graduation. The Chicago Public Schools class of 2021 will be the first high school class in the country to graduate with every student having taken a computer science course. These are all steps in the right direction that there is clearly more work that needs to be done. We need to provide opportunities for adults seeking career retraining and continuing education to have access to coding and computing skills through community colleges and, and employment training centers. To that end, I was pleased to see the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act pass the House unanimously last month. But as I regularly hear from employers in my district, demand for these skills still outstrips supply. Finally, we need to work to ensure that all students, no matter where they grow up, their background, their race, or their sex, have the opportunity to become educated in computer science in all STEM fields. Increasing the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields will not only increase our global competitiveness, but also help grow the STEM workforce. I look forward to a fruitful discussion about measures that can be taken to ensure that graduates <laughs> entering the workforce and adults retraining for new careers are equipped with the necessary expertise to meet overwhelming employer demand. Thank you again to our witnesses for being here, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski, and I now recognize the chairman of the full committee um, for a full statement, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank you for having a hearing on a subject that I know is of special interest to both of us. Uh, since our founding, American innovators have played an important role in our nation's growth and prosperity. With the rise in competition from abroad, however, we must ensure that America stays a world leader in innovation. We can do this in part by better educating American students in STEM subjects. Unfortunately, America lags behind many other nations when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and math. American students rank 19th in science and 31st in math out of the 35 industrialized countries. Uh, that, to me, is just an incredible statistic. We're in the bottom half uh, in, uh, in science and pretty close to the bottom 10% when it comes to math. We can and must do better to keep America globally competitive. We have to capture and hold the desire of our nation's youth to study science and engineering so they will want to pursue these careers. More graduates with STEM degrees means more advanced technologies and a more robust economy. A well-educated and trained STEM workforce promotes our future economic prosperity. But it is not just about the economy. These graduates have the potential to develop technologies that could save thousands of lives, jumpstart a new industry, or even discover new worlds. We can work together to ensure that students continue to go into these fields so that their ideas can lead to a more innovative and prosperous America. You may be surprised to find out that STEM originally did not include computer science in its definition. In the last Congress, I introduced the STEM Education Act of 2015, which was signed into law. This bipartisan bill expands the definition of STEM to include computer science. The bill also helps encourage students to enter STEM fields. The measure directs the National Science Foundation to continue to award competitive merit review grants to support informal STEM education programs, such as after-school science programs, and in ways that formal classroom training often does not. 
Uh, thanks to Representative Esty, a member of this committee, the bill also amends the NSF Noyce Master Teaching Fellowship Program to allow teachers in pursuit of master's degrees to participate in the program. This enables more teachers to have the opportunity to compete for the grants. Another challenge is that despite representing nearly half of the college educated and total U.S. workforce, women account for less than 25 percent of America's STEM workforce. To address this disparity, the first two science committee bills signed into law by President Trump helped support women's involvement in STEM fields. The Inspire Women Act was led by Research and Technology Chairwoman Comstock, who is chairing us today, and the Promoting Women in Entrepreneurship was led by Representative Esty. I thank them both for their efforts to help inspire women to work in STEM-related fields. Today we will hear from leaders and experts who focus on engaging students in STEM and computer science education. We need to learn what is taking place outside of the federal government so we can be sure we are not spending taxpayer dollars on duplicative programs. And we need to more effectively use taxpayers' dollars to achieve the most benefit for our students and our country. It is critical to understand what is working and how we can build on that success. A well-educated and trained STEM workforce will promote our future economic prosperity, but we must encourage our nation's youth to study science and engineering so they will want to pursue these careers. We need to ensure that young adults have the science and math skills to strive and thrive in a technology-based economy. You can't have innovation without advances in technology, and the STEM students of today will lead us to the cutting-edge technologies of tomorrow. I look forward uh, to hearing from our witnesses, but let me say at the same time, uh, Madam Chair, and also to our uh, expert panelists today, that I have a Judiciary Committee markup that began 23 minutes ago, so I'm going to need to go there and shuttle uh, back and forth. Uh, also, before I finish, I just want to point out, and I don't think I've done this before, in regard to the ranking member, Mr. Lipinski, I was reminded of this during his comments, that I believe he is the only member of the Science Committee to have received an NSF grant. Is that you're under I, I did receive one. I'm not sure I'm the only one. I, yeah. I bet you're the only one. Uh, we may have to remind Dr. Foster, who also has his own niche on the committee, that uh, he has some competition. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll yield back. Thank you. And I now recognize uh, the ranking member of the full committee for a statement, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, this is an exciting occasion for me. Uh, I first became aware of what we now call STEM education when I passed my first bill in 1974 in the Texas House. I had met Dr. John Kilby, who worked for Texas Instruments, and discovered the CHIP, the semiconductor that carried Texas Instruments around the world as a leading company, and later met Michael Dell from Austin, Texas, who came up with the Dell computer. And I knew then that we needed everyone involved. So Madam Chairperson, I, Comstock, I appreciate the fact that you're having this hearing. I was thrilled when President Obama announced his Computer Science for All initiative last year. The Computer Science for All initiative not only called attention to the need to improve computer science education, but also to the need to ensure that all students, including women and underrepresented uh, minorities, are encouraged to participate. Since President Obama's announcement, we have seen a flurry of activity and progress has been made, but we are not there yet. Representative Connie Morell and I and Dr. Ellis from Michigan worked on this subject for seven, eight years before we finally got America Competes. You know, in high school, female students are taking the computer science advanced placement exam at rates far lower than any other AP exam. In 2016, female students accounted for just 23% of the AP exam takers in computer science. Underrepresented minorities accounted for 15% of exam takers. The number of bachelor's degrees in computer science has exploded over the last several years. However, when you break this growth down by gender, it is apparent that it is almost entirely due to an increase in male graduates. 
only 18% of the bachelor's degrees in computer science are awarded to women. The same fraction of women were earning bachelor's degrees in computer science in the 70s. Structural and social barriers are preventing us from fully engaging students of both genders. Students of all ethnicities and students from all backgrounds as we attempt to increase participation in computer science. Right now, computer scientists are creating innovative products and services that will affect all of our lives. These innovations cannot meet the needs of society if they are developed without insights for women and underrepresented minorities. One encouraging advancement has been the implementation of a new AP computer science course called Computer Science Principles. The National Science Foundation supported the development of this course, and it is designed with the goal of engaging more women and underrepresented minorities in computer science. With the introduction of this new exam in 2017, participation in AP computer science exams increased by 4% for women and 5% for unrepresented minorities. This is a great step forward, but more can and must be done to engage women and underrepresented minorities at all levels of education. I look forward to discussing ways to foster a welcoming learning environment for all students to gain skills in computer science. This is essential if we are to ensure that Computer Science for All initiative launched by President Obama lives up to its name. Before I close, I'd like to make note of the efforts made by a valuable member of this committee, Representative Jack B. Rosen. Last week, she introduced the Code Like a Girl Act, which seeks to engage more girls in computer science at early levels of education, just where we're supposed to start the STEM orientation. I thank her for her efforts, and I hope to see her bill receive speedy consideration. I thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to the testimony, and I yield back. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson, and I would, uh, I, I really appreciate your comments on the uh, on women's education. And my daughter, so, but since I'm not a science major, I'll brag that my daughter was a biology major and then got her master's in forensic science, works at a, a lab here, does DNA analysis. And I credit her preschool education, actually, where she was in Montessori, where before she got out of kindergarten, she knew um, multiplication and knew all her math and had that concrete understanding of science and math. So maybe we need to also revisit with our um, with some of our education committee members how we can uh, get more Montessori and, and that kind of that concrete science education um, into our preschools since we're obviously spending lots of money on um, that, pr that preschool education, but sometimes they're not to not to knock finger painting or anything, but I, I really did the, the math and the science that Montessori has is awesome. So I'm gonna give my little Montessori plug since all my kids were in that, and now I'm battling to get my grandchildren in there too, since I credit that for all their high science scores. So before I introduce our witnesses today, I would like to ask unanimous consent to add a letter from the Computer Science Education Coalition into the record, and then I will now introduce our witnesses. So first, our first witness today is Mr. Uh, James Brown, Executive Director of the STEM Education Coalition. And prior to joining the coalition, he was Assistant Director for Advocacy at the American Chemical Society. A nuclear engineer by training, he previously worked as a legislative aide for Representative Doc Hastings of Washington and began his career as an engineer with Newport News Shipbuilding working on aircraft carrier construction. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brown received a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of New Mexico and a Master's of Science degree from Penn State, both in nuclear engineering. He also holds an MBA from George Washington University, and uh, we look forward to hearing from him. And next we have Mr. Pat Young Pradit. Is that, you want to no, say it for us again? Young Pradit. Yeah. Thank you. And he is the Chief Academic Officer of Code Org, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting computer science education. Prior to this role, he had a career as a high school computer science teacher. My husband also did that, so I got to give my husband credit for the kids being great in science and math, too. Um, 
um, where uh, he inspired students, you, <laughs> to create mobile games and apps. He has been recognized as Microsoft Worldwide Innovative Educator and is certified in biology, physics, math, health, and technology education. He received a Bachelor's of Science degree from Distinction in Biology from McGill University and a Master's degree in Secondary Science Education from the University of Maryland. And now I now recognize Mr. Lipinski to introduce our third witness. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Alvisados, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at the University of California, Berkeley, which shows I'm, even though I'm a Stanford guy, I'm not biased. Uh, Dr. Alvisados is also the Samsung Distinguished Professor of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, the founding director of the Kavli Energy and Nanoscience Institute, and director emeritus of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. In his leadership role at UC Berkeley, he oversees the university's many programs working to increase the number and diversity of students in STEM programs, and personally played a role in growing one of them, the Division of Data Science, by chairing the search committee for its dean. In addition to his academic achievements, Dr. Alvisados is the founder of two prominent nanotechnology companies, NanoSys and Quantum Corp, the latter which now is part of Dermo Fisher Scientific, the world's largest scientific instrument company. Dr. Alvisados holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Chicago and a PhD in chemistry from UC Berkeley. Okay, and our final witness today is Ms. Dee Mooney, who has been Executive Director of the Micron Technology Foundation since 2006. In her role, she drives the Micron, she drives the Micron Foundation's programs, not the, we, you don't drive the bus, but <laughs> aimed at advancing science and technology education and enhancing the quality of life in Micron's manufacturing site communities. As I briefly mentioned in my opening statement, of Micron's 13 locations in the U.S., the company has an important presence in my district, which we very much appreciate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. In fact, Micron's Manassas location is the site of the company's flagship 300-millimeter water fabrication facility deploying the world's most advanced memory technology. In addition to employing over 1,200 people on its Virginia team, Micron and Micron Foundation have donated about seven million towards Virginia education and community organizations and partner with Virginia universities to help support and inspire students in STEM education. So I wanna thank you uh, for all the important work that you do. And I think, you know, we have one example here today, but I know all of us could probably provide examples from our district where our businesses and our small businesses and startups are so engaged in our community and with our students from a very young age. You know, we have a children's science center and we have various STEM um, programs where our businesses are always showing up and active and engaged in those programs because you all better than anyone understand the need for the STEM pipeline. So it's always very exciting for me when I see that STEM pipeline starting at a local, um, you know, science fair with five-year-olds and, and your companies are there, so thank you. Um, Ms. Mooney also serves on several educational and community nonprofit boards in Boise, Idaho, and is currently the vice chair for Idaho's STEM Action Center. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Iowa State University and a master's degree in industrial psychology from the University of New Haven. So I now uh, recognize Mr. Brown for five minutes to uh, begin the testimony. Good morning, and thanks to all of you on the committee for the invitation to testify at today's hearing. One of the roles our coalition plays is to listen to and be the voice of STEM stakeholders within the policymaking process. And one of the voices that we hear from a lot are grandparents. Grandparents do their homework, and they get this issue. I will get a call from a grandparent who will read me a list over the phone of the highest paying college majors. Petroleum engineering, systems engineering, actuarial science, chemical engineering, computer science and engineering, nuclear engineering. They get it. They've done their homework. They get the fact that STEM skills are important not just to their children and their grandchildren, but to the society in general. They also get some of the ironies of this issue. So 83% of millennials sleep with their smartphones but only 16% of high school graduates have an interest in pursuing careers in science and technology. And they also get that that number would be a lot higher if we did a better job of getting women and students of color into these important fields. 
Um, I'm going to talk about three trends that are at work in the policy area that have lots of implications for STEM education. The first is what's going on at the state level. So in 2015, Congress passed the Every Student Succeeds Act. It replaced the No Child Left Behind law. And amongst other things, it grants back to the states and to districts a lot of decision-making powers over accountability systems and how they spend federal resources. 25 states so far have put forward plans under this new education law, and we just completed an analysis of what's in those plans. Um, and there are some positive trends. So 17 of those 25 states have added science to their state's accountability systems. This is a huge decision with implications for STEM education because it drives resource decisions up and down the education spectrum. A similar number of states have added career and technical education indicators and measures of advanced coursework taking like AP um, subjects that are STEM related. About a quarter of those states have also proposed to use federal resources for teacher quality programs to hire STEM educators, to invest in teacher training programs for the teachers already in the classroom and similar activities. And another quarter of those states have proposed using new federal dollars available under a new funding stream to support well-rounded educational activities to support things like STEM competitions, hands-on science activities, and STEM-focused specialty schools. However, there's a catch. Uh, the Trump administration's budget and the bills that have been moving through the House Appropriations Committee um, have been sending what I'll say are mixed signals about whether those programs will exist or what the funding levels will be for those programs. And I go into more detail in that in my written testimony. That's the first trend. The second trend is the changing nature of the economy and of the STEM workforce. You've highlighted this in your opening statements, and I know the other witnesses will say this as well. The economy is changing, STEM skills are becoming much more important to employment, and that's across the spectrum. So not just the rocket scientists, from the, from the supply room to the boardroom, STEM skills are more important. And the biggest area of growth is in the so-called middle skills jobs. About half the jobs in the STEM arena don't require a four-year college degree. Those are your STEM technicians, people in advanced manufacturing. The challenge is, parents and teachers are kind of lagging in their understanding of these trends. So people's images of those jobs are very different than the realities that exist today. And the National Science Foundation, for example, plays a huge role in studying these trends, being able to translate them into how we change our practices to capture more people who will be interested in these fields and give them the right kinds of skills. The third trend is the nature of learning is changing. One of the biggest recognitions in the STEM education community is that a lot of learning, important learning, is happening outside the classroom. It's happening online, it's happening in after school programs, it's happening in museums. Increasingly, the kids that we're talking about that are not in the STEM fields, a lot of them will get their first experience with a mentor or a hands-on learning experience. And if you talk to people in the STEM fields, those experiences are a lot of times why they chose to go the way that they did in terms of careers. And again, the National Science Foundation has an incredibly important role in supporting knowledge about how those pathways work and how people make decisions in environments outside the traditional classroom. So that's an incredibly important area. And lastly, I just say, um, there's a strong bipartisan tradition of supporting STEM education as a policy priority. A lot of that tradition originated in this room. And what I would love to say to the next grandparent that calls us up and asks for help on this subject is that the federal government has got their back on this issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young Pradit for his uh, testimony. Thank you, uh, Ms. Comstock. That was a great job. Mm -hmm. um, so Chairwoman Comstock, Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittee on behalf of Code.org, thank you for this opportunity to testify about the importance of computer science education in preparing the country's 21st century workforce. My name is Pat Jan Pradit. I'm the Chief Academic Officer of Code.org. But more importantly, I'm, the, I'm a former computer science teacher, just removed from the classroom four years ago. And being a teacher is hard. Uh, being a computer science teacher in this nation is even harder. <coughs> you are often the only computer science teacher in a school. If you're in one of the 21 states without a clear computer science certification pathway, you may have to be certified in a different subject to teach computer science. And if you're in one of the 40 states that don't have computer science standards, like Mr. Lipinski uh, already noted, you may lack any curricular direction and have to constantly craft resources on your own. The lack of support from the state level is not surprising, as there are only a handful of states that have dedicated funding for computer science. 
or have any state position that's even responsible for K-12 computer science. All of these challenges applied to me as a teacher at Springbrook High School in Silver Spring, Maryland, but my school had one thing going for it. At least it had a computer science teacher. As reported in a survey administered by Gallup, the problem is that the majority of schools, 60% don't even offer computer science. That means thousands of students, students in your districts who want to learn computer science, just can't. So the challenge before our nation is clear, preparing enough computer science teachers and creating policies that will install and sustain high quality computer science experiences for all students. So much has been said about our nation's STEM crisis, but when we talk about the STEM crisis in our economy and schools, we need to address the greatest area of concern, computing. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has projected that millions of new STEM jobs will be created between 2014 and 2024, but did you know that while 6% of new job growth will be in life sciences, where I got my undergrad degree, over 70% of new job growth will be in computing occupations? So this impact goes beyond STEM, like Mr. Brown noted. Computing occupations have become the single largest sector of new wages in the US overall. Almost half of all professionals who use advanced computing skills like coding are in non-STEM fields. So a 21st century doctor, lawyer, or even banker may not, need know, may not need to know how to write complex code, but they at least need to understand the inner workings of an app, what's a website, security, and other computing basics. And this isn't just about future jobs, it's about the 500,000 currently open jobs in our nation. These are private and public sector jobs, such as cybersecurity. How do we strengthen our nation's cyber defenses? Provide every American with a foundational K-12 computer science education. This will also build the pipeline for our nation's cyber workforce. So our crisis is that while job demand is high, only 40% of our schools teach any amount of computer science. Only 8% of our STEM graduates are in computer science. There just aren't enough Americans prepared to meet the demand. Furthermore, the existing workforce isn't diverse. The root cause is our K-12 system. For example, of the students who took the AP computer science exam in Virginia last year, only 24% were female. In Illinois, that percentage was 21%. Code.org is a national nonprofit dedicated to expanding access to computer science. So we're working on this, we with our partners. So we're known for an annual hour of code, which many members of Congress have engaged in. We, we call on uh, students all over the world to engage in one hour of coding during the week of Computer Science Education Week. So that's just the beginning. We also create free open source courses. We've trained more than 60,000 teachers nationwide in all of your states uh, to teach computer science. We partnered with 120 of the largest school districts. We even have set up a governor's partnership for K-12 computer science. There are nine governors, six Republicans, three Democrats. Governor Hogan from Maryland just joined two weeks ago. So looking forward, it's much, there is much work to do. Uh, the majority of schools in the US don't teach computer science at a time when Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, Romania, Malaysia, Japan, Sweden, and the UK. The UK has been at this for three years already, instituting nationwide computer science. Um, so Code.org and the computer science community are grateful for the help we have here on Capitol Hill. If at any point you want to talk more about what's happening in your states, your districts around computer science, that's basically my thing. Um, I go around to State Departments of Education and help drum up more work around computer science and help them with their goals as well. So thank you for this opportunity to speak, um, and I look forward to hearing from our other panelists. Um, thank you, and now we'll hear from Dr. Alevisatos. Alevisatos, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> just like it reads. I, like I have, it my reads. sister's Rapawano, and it's just like it reads, just like that, so. Madam Chairperson and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you. I'm very grateful for this opportunity um, to comment on the challenges and opportunities um, we are seeing in higher education uh, for computer science and related fields. Tragically, as was noted earlier, even as computer science and engineering and data science as well have permeated essentially every aspect of our lives in the economy, the percentage of women in underrepresented groups majoring in, this, in these disciplines has at best been holding steady and in many cases is actually declining. Further, the quantity of students we are able to train can only grow significantly 
if we imagine new ways of both inspiring and teaching students. I want to talk about the new approaches Berkeley is taking to better serve our community and the nation in this area. What can we do to increase the number and diversity of students who pursue computation and data sciences as well as other sciences and engineering subjects? First, our universities can create programs targeted to reverse this decrease um, of participation of women and minority students in computer science and related fields. At UC Berkeley, we have a whole group of programs, uh, each of which differs slightly, um, and which we're testing to see which ones work the best. Um, one is the CS Scholars Program. The most recent cohort of 65 undergraduate scholars is the largest to date and has representation of 62% female students and 26% underrepresented minority students. Another is a Computer Science Capacity Award funded by Google provides special discussion, tutoring, and other support. More importantly, I would say at this point, at Berkeley, we are opening up the power of data science to all of our students. Two years ago, we established a course called Foundations of Data Science that is based on helping students from any major or any background to address questions that interest them using the powerful tools of data science. From linguistics to chemistry, and from history to economics, students from over 60 majors have responded. This is the fastest growing program in the history of Berkeley. It will serve over 1,000 students in the fall. We are rapidly building on this success, adding follow-on classes. We just hired David Culler as our first dean of data sciences. A new undergraduate major is in development. But even more important, a minor in data science will be offered and completed by thousands of students a year with an unprecedented range of diversity. How can we build on this observation that students readily excel at technical subjects of great difficulty, even those that they previously shied away from, when they are personally engaged in asking a question they care about? At Berkeley, we are working to give every undergraduate the opportunity to engage in a hands-on discovery experience. It's amazing what happens to students' interest once you get them out of a lecture hall and into a research and discovery team. With greater inspiration and understanding of their field, we expect better student engagement and retention in their chosen majors, including computer science. To offer personal discovery experiences, to thousands more undergraduates, potentially even to all 27,000 who are at Berkeley at any one time, we will engage our talented graduate students and postdoctoral scholars as mentors. Discovery experiences hold promise to bring more talent to the hard problems our society faces and to introduce a new generation of very well-prepared students into vital sectors of our economy. As we are now entering a new phase of promoting these discovery experiences in a systematic way, uh, we're discovering that there are many paths for us to do this uh, and that the data science major will be a crucial piece of, of achieving that. Um, I hope that uh, any of you that are in the Bay Area will take some time to come and visit Berkeley to see what's going on and to meet some of our students because it's a phenomenal transformation that's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Ms. Mooney. Thank you, Chairman Comstock, Ranking Member Johnson, and Ranking Member Lipinski, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Dee Mooney, and I work for Micron Technology, specifically its foundation. Micron is a leading worldwide memory and storage solutions company. Our memory, technician, our memory technology is in the things you use every day from smartphones to laptops to now cars. This technology is increasingly critical given the growth of data and the need to access, store, and manage that information. Our company was started by four visionaries in the basement of a dental office in Boise, Idaho, reflecting the American ideas of ingenuity, grit, and innovation. Today, we're nearly 39 years, 18 countries, 26,000 patents, and more than 30,000 people strong. This level of innovation requires a robust and talented workforce, especially in the STEM fields. 
We believe STEM education is critical to cultivating tomorrow's technology leaders, not just for our team, but to advance our industry and the economy at large. While Micron is a semiconductor manufacturer, we rely on skilled programmers to develop product firmware, build software for several tools throughout our manufacturing operations. Depending on the role, our workforce needs range from technicians to PhDs. Unfortunately, we regularly see a lack of available talent to fill these skills. The Micron Foundation was created by Micron nearly 20 years ago in, in part to inspire the next generation of innovators with a focus on STEM. We have given away $88 million to improve access to STEM education and invest in local communities. We are, as Chairman Comstock mentioned, we are located in Manassas, Virginia, and we do quite a few programs there with supporting FIRST Robotics, our public schools for engineering camps, teacher grants. We bring the Micron bus there. We also are very, I'd like to highlight a program that we partner with at the Northern Virginia Community College called Systemic Solutions. This pipeline development program engages students in elementary school and inspires them to continue to pursue STEM throughout their school and career experience. In Idaho, the story is similar where we support educators and students through grants and outreach. This includes hosting a free hands-on science camp for junior high students to explore robotics, virtual reality, 3D printing, and the latest technology developments. We recently expanded this program to California this year, and we are looking to expand it to other, other communities. We also take these lessons a step further into shaping future careers with our Girls Going Tech and Women in Technical Careers speaker series. Computer science accounts for many of the fastest growing occupation, and we feel that too. During the 2015 Idaho Legislative Session, a visionary group of stakeholders helped to create the Idaho STEM Action Center to develop unique grant, training, professional development, and student opportunities. This helped pave the way for a computer science initiative passed by our state legislator last year with the intent to help clarify student learning objectives within computer science and help guide districts and educators that choose to implement computer science. It helps them have a roadmap so they know how, how to implement that in their schools. To us, this represents the type of collaboration and initiative needed to keep America on pace and beyond in a very global competitive environment. This starts by supporting an educated workforce that can compete tomorrow and well into the future. I look forward to the discussion today and learning from the other panelists. And again, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you for all um, your engagement on these issues. I know you mentioned the grandparents' interest and then the, the Children's uh, Science Center that's in Fairfax. I know uh, Micron and many other companies in the area of support. I remember being sort of a kickoff for it where uh, Microsoft gave a large grant for them also, and they are building a longer-term museum, but right now they're in one of our local malls, um, and it's my granddaughter's favorite place to um, play just about any time you mention it. She's game to get there, so and she's two and a half. Okay. So I think the, the pipeline starts young, and you all are an important part there. I think there's also family science science. I'm just going to plug all these things, because I think this is something we all need to be engaged in and involved in, and appreciate your um, helping with that. So uh, Ms. Mooney, in your testimony, you talk about working with the local public schools and universities to help engage students in, in STEMs, and, and, and I'd add preschool to that, because that's certainly what the Children's Science Center and others do. Can you uh, speak a little bit about all this? And all of you, maybe kind of, like what kind of online things can we all be promoting? And I, I know, uh, Mr. Young Pratt, you talked about some of the um, classes that are available. And I think you're sort of with the internet, the democratization of education. While we're waiting to get all these things into the classroom, what can we be um, highlighting for people? Because the great thing about, you know, in, in organizations like, um, women um, who code that we saw yesterday, 
I can assure you that group, uh, there was at least about 100 young women there. Um, it was very diverse. That it had been, you know, this was a summer long program, and it was really exciting to see uh, the the real diversity there and, and how aggressive uh, they had been. And, and all of, and again, a lot of our local companies were supporting that. But where can we plug people into this who may not find out about these programs, or how can we make sure we're doing that? If you can all address that, but I'll start with Ms. Mooney. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Comstock. We are always looking for those opportunities. We often our programs that start in junior high and high school. A lot of times, those those students are on their way. Um, so we look for opportunities back at the beginning of education where we can get them excited. And this is a this would be a good time to talk about our partnership with the STEM bus. Uh, the STEM bus rolls into a school, and we try to target low-income schools, Title I schools that might not have mm -hmm. a lot of resources at their fingertips. And the bus rolls in, and it's a big, it's 60-foot big bus. It's, it's decorated um, with bright colors, and it rolls in. There's an assembly at the school where all the kids come in, and there's drones flying around. There's music. It, it gets a lot of excitement. And then throughout the day, students are able to come outside into the bus which has been completely repurposed, and inside there's lots of fun things. Uh, there's 3D printing, there's virtual reality, lots of hands-on activities. And we talk about that really sparks their interest. That's kind of the, the exciting thing that happens. Then we work with those teachers to make sure that they can continue that path to keep inspiring those students. Great. Yes. Um, Mrs. Comstock, that was a great question about what what online experiences can be um, can be plugged so that um, students who don't have access in school can still have some type of experience. There are a number of online opportunities, co.org. We create a number of blended opportunities. They're both online and in person. Um, the Hour of Code itself is an online experience. There are tutorials that students can do. Um, and that can be done outside of the week of Computer Science Education Week. So that was the Hour of Code. And again, m many members of Congress have actually participated in an Hour of Code. Um, there are for-profits like uh, Code HS and Code Academy. Universities like Berkeley are offering free courses through uh, providers like edX. Um, and other providers like Coursera and Udacity are offering free college experiences as well. But here's the thing. Um, our research at, at the K-8 level shows that when there's a teacher in a classroom teaching these students, yes. the classrooms are more diverse and the students go further. And so that's why where, where we put our money is in the classroom and in school, making sure that these students in school can have that experience and that all students can have that experience, that they don't have to go to an online provider outside of school to get that fundamental computer science experience. Thank you. And Mr. Brown, would you like to? Um, one thing I'd add to this is, so um, four years ago, we had 500 affiliate organizations that were a part of our coalition. Now we have a little more than 700. And when we get these inquiries from people saying, what do I do in my community? A lot of times what we will want to do is connect them with the growing network of STEM organizations that are in their local communities. Mayors have STEM councils now. There are regional STEM organizations. A lot of states have these entities. And that's, you know, there are places to turn now in your local community to connect you with what's actually going on out there. Because that these activities are blossoming across the country as the states start to prioritize these. But the answer to this is oftentimes a really local answer, figuring out who in your community is mm -hmm. taking this on and connecting people who are trying to seek help with those with those connector folks. You know, and I know in the having served in the state house and you know you you note a number of you know the, the schools that don't have it as mandatory, there's always there's always a challenge when you're trying to add another class. You get a lot of pushback from the schools as well, yeah, we, we had, it was before I'd gotten in the state house, but there had been a mandate for financial literacy classes. And um, they then delayed the implementation because it was very difficult, you know, it was difficult for some of the schools to get that in there. And then it turned out, um, I, think, I think they may have, but you know, there was an online class that you could maybe help because maybe some kids wanted to be in computer science or more advanced physics than have to take a class in financial literacy for someone who already had that. So I think there is a, a need for some innovation here so that like, you know, say if you have a kid who's online, you know, doing things, how do you incorporate that? Because I know there is resistance on that state level, but we need to make sure it is available. 
and I know in my district, I, the, the young man who won our congressional app challenge that we have here every year did not have computer science at his school. Um, now, not, you know, we, we want to make sure they do have that, so that's something we're going to work with them on. But he was teaching an after-school class to his colleagues. Um, so you had a student teaching computer science after just, he had just started this himself. Brilliant young man who had started in elementary school. But as, as you said, Mr. Young, we got to get, we got to make sure everyone has access to that. So how do we work, you know, what, what has been your experience in kind of breaking through that difficulty of not wanting another mandate? Um, so ultimately, schools need to be respons uh, responsive to where our culture is heading. And uh, I look at that, that scripture up there in the Bible, where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. And constantly, uh, that's actually already happening right now in all these schools where um, they don't offer computer science. And so, uh, first off, it's Get just- Get it a, offered even if it's not mandated that you take it, Yeah, it's right? just an issue of priority sometimes. I mean, there's so many electives that high schools offer. Um, you know, sometimes things do need to go um, and, uh, and change and evolve. Uh, so we, we've seen that schools all over the, the country, districts, principals, administrators, they all figure out new and exciting ways to uh, fit computer science into the master schedule. So in fact, it's not a, even a theoretical discussion. It's already happening en masse, like uh, San Francisco Unified, uh, where Berkeley is at. Uh, they're instituting computer science K through 12, every single grade. So somehow they're fitting it in into a school district that's about 56,000 students. Um, and so whether that's integrating it into another subject or offering it as a rotation in a, at the elementary school level with music and art, schools are figuring out a way. Great. Thank you, and thank you for your work, all of you, on this. Now I yield to Mr. Lipinski. Thank you. I could sit here and ask questions all day because uh, I have so many. So let me quickly get, get into this so I could get to at least a few. Uh, Mr. Brown, you had talked about specifically middle skill jobs that where there's a, this great need and unfulfilled need. I, as I was thinking about this hearing, you know, our title is STEM and Computer Science Education, Preparing the 21st Century Workforce. I want to know what types of skills are we talking about? Because we're talking about, part of it, we're talking about computer, computer science majors computer in college as opposed to, you know, skills learned in grades, you know, K through eight. Uh, what are the skills that are necessary for the jobs that are out there? Where are we really missing? You know, where is the workforce not prepared? What types of jobs are these? Can we have some sense of uh, how many are we missing at, at different levels? Sure. I, this is a really um, complicated challenge, this middle skilled jobs question. So a good example of a new middle skilled job where where workers can do really good and not need a college degree is the auto mechanic. So we all have this analogy in our minds of, um, I can't fix my car anymore because it has to be plugged into a computer at the dealer, right? Like that's, that's the common anecdote. But if you look at how, what, a, what an auto mechanic's job is now versus say 30 years ago, an auto mechanic is now somebody who has to use a computerized interface to figure out what's wrong with the car and then they go fix it. And that's a very different image than most parents have of what an auto mechanic does or what somebody else that might be interested in that profession is. And for a long time, the people who would go into those jobs were not treated like the STEM crowd, <coughs> right? There's, a, there's a, a societal view that those jobs are OK, but they're not for my kids if my kids are going to do well in the world. And that's, frankly, just a wrong view, because if you're really good at being an auto mechanic and you work in a high-end car dealership, you might make more money in your first or second year than a college-degreed person who was maybe in the middle of their class with an engineering degree. I mean, so that, that's a misconception that's not there. So there's a whole track of students, and a lot of these students are in the CTE or the vocational technical track that are getting trained for these jobs, but a lot of times that's not where the best educators are in the school. That's not where the emphasis of the state's or the district's STEM program is. The images that w when you do person on the street polling and you ask people about STEM careers, they still identify the STEM career with the rocket scientist, the PhD. They don't have images of these middle skilled jobs to draw from. And this, so, so to get back to what those skills are, they're problem solving skills. 
They're problem solving skills that use technology. And the STEM field, there's lots of ways to teach problem solving. It just turns out that STEM is probably the least worst way to do that, right? You can teach people how to, how to solve problems without being a scientist, but learning the scientific method and learning about data and evidence are the best ways to do that within the school system. And so getting back to the point about what what we really need to do is we need to make sure the high quality programs are also in those middle skilled tracks and that we're not just focusing resources on the future rocket scientists, the people that sort of fit the description of who you expect to see when you talk about a STEM job. Uh, let me move on to uh, D Dr. Alvisados. Uh, what can we do to, uh, I, there's a great shortage of, of, of teachers. Any recommendations you have, what, what can be done so we can have more computer science or other similar related fields get people in to be teaching at the <clears throat> college level? Yeah. Well, both high school and college, uh, you know, we have um, an enormous uh, talent pool of graduate students and uh, also undergraduates who are really um, learning uh, computer science and STEM fields and who spend spontaneously, because it's their love, they spend time uh, for example, a graduate student mentoring uh, undergraduates or high school students, and likewise college students doing the same thing. So those people are showing that they have a deep desire uh, to do these things. Many of them could use much more help learning how to be mentors early uh, as part of their education. So if they're in a STEM discipline, actually having training on how to be a mentor, which is a vital part of actually being part of a science team or an engineering team. Uh, so teaching those skills uh, in a systematic way to large numbers will open those careers to them uh, and help them to do better. But as you know, there are also a lot of structural reasons why um, the teaching careers aren't always as attractive as they could be in some of our uh, areas, and some of those are controlled by local policies, but it's clearly a huge problem to make it more attractive to people. Can, can we get, if I, if the chair allowed, can we, what about programs to try to get people who are um, out in, in, in working to, to come into the university and, and, and teach or into the high yeah. school classroom to teach? So um, in our discovery experience program that we're planning, um, one way, we're, we're finding many ways, let's say in our case, we have 27,000 students, we want them all to have a discovery experience. We need to build a network for that. So for example, a postdoctoral scholar or a graduate student would mentor. But even if we do that, there's still more personal mentorship that's needed. So we're inviting in um, all of our colleagues from the Bay Area technology community and also from many local businesses and even from community organizations to come in and mentor our students. And also, we're putting in a requirement that every student actually, as they mature through the program, they themselves spend a certain amount of time mentoring in a local high school. And so we kind of see, to scale this, you need to have a kind of network of people at different levels, and each time you've gone up to a next level, you should be reaching a hand uh, down to the earlier stage to help them, because that helps the numbers to work well for, for such a complicated, large number of people problem. And so Mr. Lipinski, I'd like to add that there's actually a great model program in the U.S. right now sponsored by Microsoft. It's called TEALS. It's, uh, I think it's technology, education, literacy in schools. And, and basically what happens is they take engineers from a number of companies, not just Microsoft, and these engineers go in to the classroom um, sometimes three to five days a week in the morning right before they go to work, and they actually teach a computer science class. And so this is in schools where they just can't find a teacher to teach computer science. And this is happening in, I, I believe, hundreds of schools nationwide uh, in, in um, several dozen districts. And so that's a, a model program that I'd like to call out. Thank you very much, Abe. you back. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. Marshall. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, sir, Mr. Young Product, I, I missed your number. How many computer science jobs are open across the country now, approximately? So 500,000 open computing jobs, and those include jobs that require a four-year degree, as well as the middle school's jobs that middle skills jobs that sure. Mr. Brown mentioned. Okay, I want you all to write down these numbers, see if you come up with the same conclusion that I come up with. I just met with Dr. Ben Carson. He told me there's six million skilled jobs open in this country right now. We're at a 16-year low for unemployment across the country. 
My state of Kansas has 20,000 open jobs. I think I read that Ms. Comstock has 30,000 open computer jobs in her state. You just told us we have 500,000 open jobs across the country in computer science. Despite that, so here's the uh, counterintuitive things I'm learning. I'm a freshman up here. A half million people have given up looking for a job. There are districts in our country with unemployment of 17 to 20 percent. And in those districts, 25 percent of people are on uh, Medicaid assistance, and 50 percent of them are on food assistance. My theory, see if you disagree with me, is we don't have a, a job problem. We have a job skills problem in this country. Uh, everywhere I go in my town halls, whether it's the construction in, uh, industry uh, or skills set, it's, it's the, the, we don't have a skilled, a skilled workforce anymore. What's the disconnect? What are we doing to motivate people to not work or to not get that skill set to work? What, what has happened in our culture that we don't motivate people to get the proper skill set? I think this is a cultural problem. Mr. Young, Prada, you've got to comment what's happened to our culture? I can, yeah, I can talk about it just from my experience teaching. So at some point, we had this definition of digital literacy that was, let's just learn how to use a computer. Like, here's a mouse, here's a keyboard, let's learn how to type and create presentations, right? And that, yeah. that, that was the thing um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, lots of us learned how to use computers in, in a course like that. But what those courses missed is how to dig deeper and how to actually program the computer, how to create technologies of your own. And so because of that, we have this huge gap between all these open computing jobs and a workforce that isn't that just isn't skilled to use those, to, to access those types of jobs. We have people who may be able to use a welding machine, but they're not able to program a welding machine. And so with this level of automation that we're seeing in manufacturing jobs these days, we see people who are being automated out. Now, here's the thing. They can be automated in if they learn how to now program those machines. And in the same way, we have a great, I mean, a, again, we have a great opportunity ahead of us with the transportation industry, with all this automation of cars. I mean, folks, in 15 years, I mean, there will be a lot of kids who don't even think about driving. It's just nonsense to them. They'll just, you know, call up, call up a <laughs> oh, car to drive. Yeah, I need to move on. For them. So, so we have some incredible community colleges and technical colleges in my district. Um, and I think that they're poised to probably make the quickest adjustments. Mr. Brown, can you give some comments? Are, are community colleges responding? What are they teaching? What, what are they doing? Well, I think you used a term that's super important here, which is responsiveness. So much of this challenge, they're, they're, we, we have low unemployment, but we have also low participation in the workforce, right? right. The underemployment number is probably 20% of the population, Scary. more, right? Part of that challenge is because it's too hard to transition from one set of skills to a pretty similar related set of skills. And a really good, I'll give you an example or a problem if we could solve that would get at this, that community colleges probably play a role, and that's transitioning military veterans. Yes, sir. So there's 100,000 people discharged from the military every year. About 60% of them have STEM skills. But it's really hard for a combat medic or electrical technician to get a, a commercial credential because we can't manage that skills gap problem just for a highly trained population that we know their skills and yet they don't line up with the educational institutions and so community colleges have a lot more flexibility than some other institutions they're dealing with a lot more diverse population that has a lot of different skills that that if we could manage that transition alone of getting more of those 60,000 military veterans into stem careers it would help us tell the metal technician in Indianapolis who work for carrier a better way are to you get a seeing job. who's doing it right who's who's the most successful place you see doing this? You know, the trend that uh, I think speaks most to the innovation is the fact that companies are doing their own training for high school they sure students now, yep. right? That's, I mean, that's the commercial motive. That's capitalism at work. It's probably not the ideal solution, but that's where a lot of companies are. Is they're doing this training in-house and skipping the education system altogether, which says we have a problem. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and, and you're exactly right. I have, I've seen that, and just in visiting, um, whether it's a manufacturing plant where they're, they, they have, actually the businesses bring people in and train them on that equipment and, and because for that very reason. Um, but I would also mention the high schools, you know, I think you're exactly right. The community colleges are a great place to be put it, but go back even earlier again. Our high schools are trying to do more of that, and I think making sure that they are, uh, faster and, and, and really adapt quickly like that and then move it on down into junior highs and 
Again, and then having these kids get some work experience too and being exposed to all that. So. Well, and can I just, I, I want to make sure this is a clear point. The companies are doing it because the education system can't keep Fails. up. Yeah. That's not to say we have, you know, we should be giving up on fixing our educational institutions. The high schools that people really value are the ones that are preparing kids for specific career paths. That's what the grandparents are asking for yeah. when they call up. Great. Okay, I now, oh, Mrs. Johnson is not here, but here we have uh, Miss Esty now recognized for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank the ranking member and the chair, uh, chairwoman for this important topic we're discussing today. And uh, actually, Mr. Brown, I, I was going to start with lower grades in education, but as a member of the Veterans Committee and working a lot on this issue, I'd like to start with you about what we can better do, because it is, it is a crime, actually, that we are not providing our veterans with a better ability to transition to civilian workforce. And you're exactly right. They've got the skills. But again, do you think stackable credentials? Is this something we should be working within the VA to try to do this? How do you, or transition from DOD? Because some of us have been looking at elements. Can we do a better job of translating what are those Defense Department skill sets that they have and how can we translate? And if you have suggestions for us about how we can be helpful, I can tell you there's huge commitment on this committee and across Congress to do better for our veterans. And you just think about it, something like cybersecurity. We have skill sets there that are going to waste and people who are looking for jobs. So we are passionate about filling that gap and putting veterans to work. So thoughts any of you have on what we can do on that I would be welcome. Well, so let me first say thank you for your service on the Veterans Committee. And the Veterans Committee in the House just passed a GI Bill reform, right? And one of the things that's really important, sort of under the radar, is that that bill contains a provision to allow veterans who are studying in career fields that take more than a certain number of credits so that they're not basically aged out of their GI Bill of benefits. And those are the kinds of adjustments in our system we have to make to meet the unique, you know, STEM has a lot of unique requirements. It has laboratories, it takes longer. The transition issue for veterans, the reason why I use it as a, as a litmus test for this problem is, part of the reason that's not happening is it, it brings in all these factors we're talking about. So ve veteran nurses have to meet state certification requirements in nursing. And I think there's a lot we could do to make those more portable, stackable, you know, thing, things of that nature to make skill, because employers are looking at cross state lines, hiring practices, there are big regional disparities in this issue. And so those are the types of things we have to take on and reform those, those boundaries between, it's, it's interagency, intergovernmental type of things that are gonna help us solve that problem. It's not that the innovation's not there to do that kind of training. I mean, universities and community colleges can do it, but it's, it's the rules of what constitutes a, a licensed person in a lot of those professions that are some of the barriers. No, I think you're right. There's siloing and there's guild mentality. And, and I would note, a lot of us here have worked on diversity issues for women, girls, people of color. The military is much more diverse than it used to be. And so one of the ways we could rapidly change the face of what somebody who's in STEM looks like is to really aggressively um, look to place people with service in the military into the STEM fields. And I think it's underattended to, and I'd love to follow up with all of you on thoughts about how we can do that. And yes, we actually have a special provision on STEM skills in the GI Bill and we've made it lifelong benefits to address this issue about needing to reskill um, over years. So that deals with, in part, the immediate problem of like, how do we fill these mid-level skills right away? I'd like to have you opine a little bit and talk about what you think we can do in elementary level. I know several of my colleagues here are working on legislation built off of things we've seen, particularly for girls. If they aren't engaged by eighth grade, it doesn't matter what you have in high school. They've already self-selected out of these fields. Um, so thoughts about what we can do on that. And again, uh, Mr. Young Pradit, that could be something we should be not just high school students, but in elementary going in and talking about science and computer fields. Thanks. So um, we've been active in this area, probably uh, the most active of all the K-12 areas that we work in, elementary, middle, and high school. So I mentioned that we've trained 60,000 plus teachers over the last three and a half years. The majority of that, I'd actually estimate probably around 52,000 of that is at the K-5 level. And so what we're doing is we're taking the media specialist, the computer lab teacher, even the um, 
the classroom level teacher, and we're teaching them how to integrate computer science into their uh, math lesson, their science lesson, or even to offer it as an elective alongside um, art, music, PE as a, as a special or an elective in, in a rotation. Um, and you know what's wonderful about that? So I know that um, a number of uh, members of the subcommittee are sponsoring the Code Like a Girl Act, which is wonderful. Um, elementary school teachers are so hungry for computer science. You would think that it'd be hard to like convince them to like, you know, uh, bring it into their curriculum because they have so much going on already, which they do, but they are so hungry and they're so willing. Great, thank you. I see I'm out of my time and I yield back. Thank you all very much. And I now recognize uh, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was thinking about that uh, K-5 program. Uh, I decided when I was in fourth grade, I wanted to be an engineer, engineer, whatever. And uh, ended up doing that. I uh, actually planned out who, where I was gonna go to school. Started then and started praying. So uh, my question is, is kind of around that. Uh, first of all, I know there is a need in everyday life to understand something about STEM. A couple weeks ago, my wife's washing machine broke and I got a little manual on it off the internet and it's, it's a self-diagnosing. So I pushed a couple of buttons and up pups a binary number and it was 12. And so I looked on this little chart, 12, bad motor control. Sure enough, that's what was wrong with it. So even in the household, it's good to know a little bit about STEM. Uh, but we have spent a lot of money locally, uh, I know, in our area, along with um, K-12 funding and so forth, to try to draw more people into STEM. Um, is that, does that need any more coordination, or is it working? Is there any empirical data that would say this, this works? We're really getting a lot more people, not necessarily uh, from one particular area, just is it working? Anybody? Chairman Comstock. Uh, Mr. Webster, thank you for your question. And you are exactly right. There is a lot of not only our foundation, but a lot of company foundations, um, nonprofits that are working on this, this issue. We, we tend to focus very much on the schools, on the students, on the teachers, and that's fantastic to help support them. But we've noticed, even with our grants, that there tends to not be a parent component. And if we can educate the parents to the importance of these skills, help them to understand how to encourage their students to stay with it, that that is an element that can definitely help. Um, We've also had focus groups where, where parents have come in and they've talked to us and they've said things like, you know, I wasn't good at math, you probably won't be either. And that really it is very damaging and, and that, can, um, that, that can hinder a student's progress in that area. So we're trying to do a little bit more, uh, in fact, actually a lot more around uh, the importance of parents and bringing them into the equation. So does that, um, is that universal or is it in its infancy or? I, I would say with our programs and even the grant requests that come across our desk for us to fund, that element seems to be missing. So we're, we're trying to encourage a little bit more of that. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of other areas that, that um, we could certainly be focusing on, but that is, that's, a, that's a, a something that we find missing quite a bit. Okay. I just like, oh, yeah, go ahead. I could just say quick. I, I mean, I think this comment about um, when a young person, if they're in, off in elementary school, but also very much in middle school, and then it, it happens all the way through, when you get uh, this kind of um, experience where somebody will say, you know, I wasn't good in STEM, you may not be, or math isn't for me, that kind of thing. Uh, it really closes things off for people in a way that then they internalize. And, and that is a cultural phenomenon that really hurts. And um, so I think, to your point, that inside the home matters enormously, but also inside the schools, um, giving experiences where people can actually have something that they touch outside of just a, 
a test that's going to be graded, but something where they can actually have a success um, has an enormous effect on people. And I think that many of the curricula are really evolving that way now so that people, in addition to their classroom experience, have an experience outside of the classroom where they experience a success. And that helps them to come back in. And that has to happen all through the system. Would directed scholarships, maybe enhanced scholarships for STEM, does that help? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Webster, I'll say that um, the, the number one way, the number one most effective way to spend money in computer science to actually increase the number of computer science offerings is in-service professional development. That means professional development for teachers who are already in the classroom and teaching them how to um, just offer computer science as an elective, as an extra course, or what have you. And it's already proven AP computer science principles, which um, Ms. Johnson mentioned, is the largest AP launch of any uh, computer science course, uh, of any AP course ever. And so that was driven by in-service professional development for teachers. Awesome. Can I, can I just add one? Well, thing? I'm out of time, Chair. Oh, if you, Mr. Like Brown, if you'd like Chair. to. So two things I would add to that. I would definitely concur that the, the high quality teacher component is, that's the data show us that high quality teachers and high quality experiences are the biggest impact on students. But I would like to say something about the scholarship question you asked. One of our experiences over the last 15 years, going back to the America Competes Act and different attempts to try and incentivize students is scholarships are less effective than people think because the financial incentives alone of making it easier for a student to go to college will not necessarily overcome their lack of pre preparation for success in uh, another STEM-oriented career. So it's their degree of preparation that's more of a selector for whether they can succeed with a scholarship or with some kind of financial incentive than just doubling the amount of scholarship money that's out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I, would, I, I think you're so right on the teacher um, continuing to upgrade that because I mean that's why sometimes bringing the outside people in too helps because they're in the real world their skills are upgraded my husband was teaching computer science in the early 80s then he was a principal now he has to go back and he's there's a lot of upgrading to do there so anything we can do to continue to upgrade those skills so I uh, now recognize uh, Ms. Rosen for five minutes Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the chairwoman, ranking member, uh, Mr. Lipinski, and all of our guests. And what I want to say, first of all, is I am a girl who codes, who made it to Congress, who started her career as a computer programmer in the 1970s with the card deck, learning BASIC and COBOL and Fortran and Assembler. And I know what an exciting career it is, how creative it is, and how much I learned. And I use those skills every single day here. So I applaud what each and every one of you are doing. There weren't very many of us doing it in the 70s. There still aren't enough. It comes down to inspiration, education, and teaching. So I want to thank you all for that. I'm a proud uh, sponsor of the Code Like a Girl Act. And today, uh, we're going to introduce with uh, Rep. Knight from this committee the Building Blocks of STEM Act, which is going to put some money into that early childhood education to let kids know that it is creative and exciting as you want to make it um, to to have a career in technology. So to that end, I really want to ask you, what else can we do in Congress to help make this a reality? Helping with veterans and retraining, helping with other training programs, teaching our teachers. So how can, how can I be helpful in Congress to make these kinds of things happen, to fill these jobs and let people know that um, they're capable of doing it? I'll take a first crack at that. First off, I think you, you, you've definitely got my award for the coolest bill name I've heard. <laughs> thank you for I'm that. I'm no longer a girl, but I feel like code like a. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I would point to that I think Congress can do is make sure that we're delivering on the promises we've made to schools to fund the programs that do, in fact, impact their lives. NSF does a lot of work in this area. There have been attempts in the past to, to narrow NSF's focus to just undergraduate or just K-12, or I think NSF has to do it all within the realm of STEM learning because we're learning in lots of different ways. To your point about elementary education, one of the things that we saw 
under No Child Left Behind is a narrowing of the curriculum to math and reading. And that's why I highlighted the fact that states are adding science to their accountability systems because the data show really clearly that impacted elementary science learning the most. And one of the curious things I see, I've seen this as a parent and it's in the data too, is that elementary STEM night brings in everyone, yeah. right? The girls, the boys, all the different students. In middle school, there are a lot less girls. Yes. And in high school, it's all dudes, right? So, so there's definitely a phenomenon that's going on there that it's, it's good for Congress to be aware of it because it's not just this committee, it's the education committee, right. it's all the other things, but you've got to work together to have a solution that addresses all of these things across all of those different policy mechanisms. Let's talk about two things that um, a lot of the members here have already done um, and then build on that. So one thing is the 2015 STEM Education Act, and that included computer science as part of the federal definition of computer science. In the state of Maryland, higher ed institutions heard about that and realized, gosh, we offer a STEM endorsement at our university. We probably need to include some computer science in it if computer science is now part of the definition of, of STEM. So they actually did that on their own because of that act. So that's one um, positive effect from that, from that act. Um, adding computer science to the list of well-rounded education subjects in ESSA, what that, done, what, what that has done and it continues to do is um, increase the uh, priority of computer science at the state level. And so even states like uh, Connecticut, Miss Etsy is, isn't in here anymore, but um, Connecticut has included computer science as part of their ESSA plan. That wouldn't have happened if right. computer science was included in ESSA. So I think the focus of computer science um, in STEM and providing guidance around computer science and STEM funding is a, is a constant thing that um, Congress can continue to do. Go ahead, Ms. Mooney, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Comstock. Uh, Ms. Roden, thank you for your inspirational words to, <laughs> to start off with. That's great that you're a girl who codes. Uh, Anything that you can do to continue to incentivize teachers to teach computer science and, and teach STEM. Uh, we have a program that we're working on at our local university where we take freshmen that are majoring in computer science or engineering and partner them with a teaching certificate Oh. So when they graduate, they not only will have that engineering or computer science degree, but they'll also be able to teach. If there would be an incentive, I know sometimes the, um, the funding when they come out isn't, uh, it isn't equitable, but if they have an incentive to go into the classroom with that, we think that is fantastic. And any time that we can get somebody that, especially for girls, if we can get a female teacher in the front of the room, uh, somebody that they can aspire to that looks like them, any of those type of programs would be very helpful. No, oh, thank you. And I'd like to see that tech bus, um, yeah. that tech mobile yeah. in every community in America. Wonderful. I think that would be great. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. Hulk Grin for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you all so much. Appreciate your work. Appreciate you being here. This is such an important subject and something I'm passionate about. I think all of us are, uh, but uh, a privilege to uh, join with our uh, ranking member of the subcommittee. Uh, Dan Lipinski is co-chair of our STEM caucus here in Congress and just continuing to be talking about it. It really is something that brings us together. There's way too many things that divide us up here, but this is one of those things that absolutely brings us together of what can we do to prepare the next generation, our best and brightest, to go into STEM fields, realizing that uh, so much of our nation is dependent on the next explorers and discoverers and, and uh, researchers who are gonna, going to have incredible breakthroughs. Just had the privilege uh, a couple of weeks ago to have a graduation of something that we started called our STEM Scholars uh, in the 14th Congressional District. It was 19 high schoolers, 10 young women, nine young men, uh, where it was a year-long program. I met with them uh, once a month, and we would go to different places around uh, the district that I represent, seven counties just west of Chicago, north of Chicago, uh, learning about ways for them to apply STEM education in the workforce. So we went to Fermilab, a national lab in my district. We went to uh, the Kane Tubular, which does uh, tube bending uh, for exhaust systems on rocket engines. That's in St. Charles, Illinois. We went to Flavors of North America, FONA, uh, which does uh, chemistry of taste and smell uh, in our foods, many, many other things, Digital Design Manufacturing Institute, downtown Chicago, phenomenal. I mean, it was great. Uh 
I, I learned a lot. Uh, I think uh, the, the high schoolers learned a lot. But we'd spend maybe an hour and a half learning about how they could apply this, and then we'd spend maybe an hour for me to hear from them of what has worked in their lives, what sparked that interest, what sparked that passion, and how can we take that and share it uh, with others. The other thing we saw every place we went is the need for uh, computer programming, uh, that this is, uh, that the, the jobs are there. Uh, Dr. Marshall, who was here a little bit earlier, talked about that, you know, that uh, I hear it so often of how we need more programmers, and it's almost like this guaranteed career path if someone is willing to dedicate themselves to doing that. I want to just get your thoughts. Uh, what I was hearing from some of my STEM scholars and others is that they've had to kind of go outside of school to find opportunities for programming. Many of them are part of robotics teams, which I think are phenomenal. Uh, some great programming opportunities that are part of that. Others have done some other coding, uh, and so grateful for that. But uh, I, I guess my first question I'll, I'll address to uh, Mr. Young Product, and I do appreciate code.org. I've gone, gone through that the last few years with different high schools and young uh, middle schools uh, and grade schools, and had my own kids uh, with me uh, as we were doing that. And uh, just a really good program uh, that I, I appreciate. I just wanted to see, um, you know, as a parent, I've got my wife and I have four kids. My youngest, my 13-year-old, I think really wants to, to go into uh, programming or uh, some other science field. What would you recommend that I could be doing to be helping our school do more, but also looking for more opportunities as a parent to open up opportunities uh, for my own children uh, or other students as well? Um. First off, I want to thank you for participating in the Hour of Code so Great. many times. Um, uh, that really helps the, the cause uh, at the local level in Illinois as well as the national level to see members of Congress participate in that event. Um, one thing I wanted to note about Illinois, uh, Mr. Lipinski, Mr. Hulkerin, there actually is a, an Illinois State Task Force for Computer Science. They just submitted their recommendations about a week ago, so you might want to take a look Good. at that. Um, in terms of uh, increasing opportunities. Uh, you know, the Hour of Code actually has a section called Beyond an Hour of Code. And so there are all these online, self-paced experiences that kids can do on their own and teachers can pick up and bring into the classroom. And these are things that don't require a whole new course. The science teacher, the math teacher, can just take a, a little break from the standard curriculum and introduce some computer science. So that's one way of doing it and making them aware of it. And then obviously there are a lot of after school activities as well, like those robotics clubs, first robotics, and things like that. So these are ways to get kids engaged when they don't have something in school. But again, I always repeat, the most important lever is getting a teacher in the school to offer that course. Yeah. Just a few seconds left, but uh, Dr. Alavisados, if I could address this to you, according to your testimony, 100 out of 1,576 schools, or about 6%, produce over half the number of graduate students in the U.S. with bachelor's degrees in computer science. Why is this, and what would it take to increase the number of graduates from more schools? Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, look, this is an enormous challenge right now because um, most schools just don't have the faculty to, to, to do it. And, of course, you're competing with this enormous demand in the workforce right. uh, for people with those skills. Instead of teaching, they can be in the workforce and be better compensated. So and that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, I think that the, what makes it more attractive for people is when the job itself also has um, components to it that are outside of, sorry, just the strict classroom. <laughs> and I think that that's the case for the uh, people that you want to be teaching these classes uh, at the level where they're going to be producing undergraduate uh, degrees. Uh, they have to be engaged themselves also in thinking about new ideas and attacking problems that society really cares about. That motivates people. Many people will, in fact, be in careers that don't compensate them quite as well if they have the opportunity to do something they find greatly meaningful themselves. And so I think trying to approach how we can offer the opportunity to people who teach in those organizations, that opportunity to be thinking about cybersecurity research or things of those kinds, that gets them motivated and they'll stay. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Again, could go on for a long time. This is uh, so important. Um, would love to hear a little bit more uh, 
coding boot camps, we're hearing about some of these things that have been happening that I think have been pretty powerful and even trying to find ways to bring that to younger kids to go beyond I think could be uh, amazing. Also, we've seen some incubators start up uh, in some of our universities where it's that practical uh, applied and great relationships being built while they're still in school. But uh, my time has long past expired. I apologize. I yield back. Oh, no. Thank you. And we now recognize Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Chair Comstock and Ranking Member Lipinski and our witnesses. Uh, I also serve on the Education Committee. I've had a lot of conversations about this topic. I'm the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional STEAM Caucus, which now has 87 members, including the chair and the ranking member. And I have invitations here for those of you who are not yet on the caucus. STEAM recognizes the importance of STEM, but also the value of arts and design to teach students how to think creatively and critically and be adept at problem solving. We have many examples in my district in Oregon of the benefits of STEAM, for example, the Nike World Headquarters, where they have um, engineers developing state-of-the-art equipment and uh, scientists experimenting with new materials and artists making the products unique. We have uh, right now scientists and engineers working with architects and designers to build new uh, high buildings out of cross-laminated timber. We have two nationally recognized public STEAM schools where educators are challenging students in STEM topics, uh, but also encourage them, encouraging them and inspiring them to create and imagine and make things, skills that we're all, will all be really extremely useful when they reach the workforce. Mm -hmm. But this just it is not just happening in Oregon, it's happening across the country. Uh, General Motors just said this about an upcoming STEAM conference. It's important for students to understand that not only does GM employ many engineers with STEM-related backgrounds, but also requires people who excel in the artistry that designers bring to the job of designing beautiful cars. Uh, there's a couple of researchers at Michigan State University, the Root Bernsteins, they write and study about creativity. They found the more accomplished scientists are, the more likely they are to have an artistic hobby and be engaged in arts and crafts. Dr. Mariel Hardiman at Johns Hopkins just did a, you're nodding your head at all of this, Doctor, you know this. <laughs> at Johns Hopkins just did a, a, a study showing that students who learn STEM classes with arts integration have better retention than students in conventional lessons. And we've had a lot of conversations about the gender gap in STEM. Uh, Two Bit Circus, was, which is a Los Angeles-based engineering and entertainment company, just did a survey, hundreds of, of families. They confirmed the gap, it's no surprise. Boys say they're interested in technology, and girls say they like art. In fact, 99% of the parents surveyed said their daughters did arts and crafts. So when girls find out that they can do art and STEM, we're starting to close the gap. So last week, the STEAM caucus and the CTE, Current Technical Education Caucuses, held a joint briefing. There was a representative there from the Rhode Island School of Design. They've been academic leaders in STEM. Their former president came from MIT. He was at our, our um, caucus kickoff years ago. Uh, this representative from RISD has been traveling the world. Um, this is happening, every school in Barcelona is now gonna be STEAM instead of STEM. Beijing, they're expanding STEAM instead of STEM. It is not the t time now for the university to fall, be, or, excuse me, for the United States and our universities and our K-12 system to fall behind in being innovative. Um, my, for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, Governor Kasich just said in his last State of the State uh, address last year, uh, STEAM education, uh, I add the capital A for the arts. Any student who's going to succeed later in life, including someone choosing a technical career, is going to need creative skills and know how to apply creative thinking. These skills are best developed by exposure to the arts, science, technology, engineering, math, and arts. And Governor Kasich said this, arts community, did you ever think you'd see a conservative Republican ever say this? But we believe it, these are essential for success in the 21st um, century careers. So, and I wanna emphasize, I mean, the chairwoman talked about Montessori. Montessori, great model, they emphasize arts and music as well. So they're adding science and STEM, but they don't cut arts and music. And we, we heard from one of our panelists about how during No Child Left Behind curriculum was, was narrowed. So thank you to all of you who mentioned the importance of funding in, under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, it, it's so important, uh, Title IV, uh, critical to have that funding that focuses on well-rounded education, including STEAM and computer science. So Mr. Brown, can you tell us how 
uh, through all of these coalitions, how can we help students become better creative problem solvers and innovative thinkers? And what role do you see for arts and design? Well, one of the things the data shows us is however you get kids interested in these fields, they do better in the classroom if they're interested. And I think that's the hook of STEAM. I mean, some kids are going to get really excited about the creativity aspects of it. That's what will bring them in. Others respond to mentorship. Others respond to doing things with their hands, right? However you can get kids interested in these fields, that's how you will make them do better, give them the ability to do better in school. Kids who are on football teams tend to be motivated to stay academically eligible so they can play football, right? I hope that same thing is happening with robotics competitions and other things where the social capital of liking something is helping them do better in school. So it's things that get kids interested in meeting them where they are that will help us with this equation. So right. I think one of the things the National Science Foundation can do that's incredibly important is do better and more extensive studies of these phenomena so we understand exactly how to amplify them and to take advantage of them and establish the connections between the value of inspiration and interest and performance in the classroom so that we understand that these programs are not just great because they get kids smiling, but also because they contribute to the outcomes that we know are valuable and that we'll spend scarce dollars well, on. Absolutely, and then the brain researchers there, the Oregon Health Sciences University Brain Institute, there have been studies that show that when students have both halves of their brain educated, they do become more creative and innovative, and it's critical thinking that, that, is, that is so important. And so thank you for the, the nodding heads. And I do invite mm -hmm. any of the, the committee members who are not yet on the STEAM caucus to join, um, and we'll get the number up past 87. Thank you for the, to the panel. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. And I, I do appreciate your emphasizing on the arts in that, since I have a wolf trap in my, uh, my uh, district. They have uh, a wonderful uh, STEAM program that, they, that now is, and I think Ohio is one of the states, so before uh, Governor uh, Kasich was celebrating that. Wolf Trap was sharing this program all around the country, and I think it's now gone beyond ev even even this country. And they and it was something we started in the state house where we just gave them a grant to to do that, and they have they've been wonderful. And it also, since my granddaughter's favorite show is talking about grandparents, I'll play. My, I will uh, talk about my granddaughter again. Her favorite TV show. Usually, I'm not promoting promoting TV shows, but Little Einstein, which is, st it's STEAM, it's not just STEM. They have music all throughout that program. So it's all science and she knows all this classical music now from Little Einsteins. And I got her, to, you know, she started watching that because we had a, a young man who came from our district and he had gotten perfect scores on everything in math and science. And so I did ask him, like, well, what did you do? What'd your and I said, well, you probably didn't watch any TV or do He said, no, I watched Little Einsteins. So <laughs> very well-rounded on that. So sorry to, but I really, and I'll plug all the members also join that STEAM caucus too, because it's great. So I now uh, recognize um, Mr. Beyer for five minutes. Th thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Young Pratt, what role does video game playing in any of this? And how does the, all the kids, you know, right now you hear video game is so much bigger than the film industry, and that more girls are playing than boys. Um, so what role, if any, does it play in stimulating interest in computer science? Well, that is a great question at a great time, actually, since we just talked about STEAM and Mr. Brown talked about uh, however way you get them interested, that's the way to go. So, uh, in fact, I, I taught game design and game programming as a teacher, and that was my hook, not just for men, but for women as well. Um, and in fact, we had a special uh, women's club just for making apps and games. Um, so I'd say the, the role is it's a hook, number one. Number two, it's a great environment for introducing the arts, um, the programming aspect, as well as an entrepreneurship aspect. Video game programming is just a, a great medium for exercising all these different skills and, and areas of interest. Um, and it's obviously important that we teach our kids how to create these video games and not just play these video games. So all those girls who are playing video games on their smartphone these days, Candy Crush, whatever, they need to really think about how these games work at the minimum, and then hopefully also learn how to program these games. Great, thank you very much. Ms. Mooney, um, 
you know, it's, it's sort of, it's been written greatly that um, Silicon Valley is an incredibly unfriendly place for women. And uh, even New Yorker cartoons about, you know, um, and that high-tech startups in general um, are fairly functionally misogynist. So how, how do you, there's a hard glass ceiling there, especially in these high-tech places. How do you encourage young women to study computer science when they have no hope of ever being a manager or an owner? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Chairman Comstock. Mr. Beyer, we, we hope that there will be inspiration along the way so they, they don't automatically think there's no hope for them. We have started a Women in Technical Career Luncheon series where we bring women engineers, not just from Micron, but from area uh, area companies to go into high schools and have lunch with the girls. And they talk about their struggles and they talk about the grit that's needed and their mentors that helped them through the way. And we feel that this conversation, it's very comfortable. It's at the girls' high school, uh, bring in pizza. They can have a very intimate discussion with how these female engineers have progressed through their career and establish relationships with the females. So as the students are going through finishing their high school and on off into college, they have a, a mentor, a buddy by their side, helping them every step of the way. But it really is about making sure that, that females see themselves and, and can see the path and have some support all the way, uh, all, all along the way. I'd also suggest we need to try to figure out what, if anything, we can do to help change the culture sure. in that high-tech community. Sure. But Mr. Brown, um, you, Dr. Marshall talked about uh, you're reconciling the 500,000 open computer jobs with the 6 million Americans who stopped looking or the, that, you know, and everyone talks about the skills gap. How, um, how credible is it or what's the dilemma when you take a 50-year-old, 55-year-old, 60-year-old coal miner, steel worker, textile worker who's been displaced by the new economy? How readily can they adapt to computer science? You've, you've hit right at the heart of the issue there. I mean, that's a difficult problem, right? You have to look somebody in the eye and say your skills are dated. If you want to get a job, you've got to have a different set of skills, or maybe you've got to move to a different location, right? And one of the things our education system doesn't do very well is target that, that specific area within society. Our educational institutions move really slow. Uh, he, Dr. Marshall also asked about community colleges. And the solution to those problems are probably going to come from the smaller, more nimble, more online places within the education system that can lower those barriers so that you, because what you really can't say to a 50 year old laid off electrical engineer or a coal miner is you got to go to college for four years and pay $150,000 to get a job, right? That's not viable at all. And so many of the initiatives that we focused on job retraining are not focused on the structural aspect of you have people with mismatched skills. So we haven't really done much in that space. And the innovators that are happening in that space are focusing on not degrees necessarily, but employable credentials. And that's when you see companies looking to hire veterans or looking to hire other displaced populations, generally what they're not looking for is, is a degree as the certification for employability. It's some other form of credentialing. And again, I go back to the fact that the National Science Foundation is doing research on all these different modalities. Teachers people in the education system don't understand this problem either. So when that person shows up in a community college, they may not know what that 50-year-old displaced employee needs either. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I know we uh, share a lot, lot of constituents at George Mason University, and I would give them a plug because they have the Video Game Institute, which is a, a great uh, place. And, and those are six-figure jobs that people are getting in that video game industry, and it's they're in medicine, they're in you know all kinds of fields, and as as you, as you all know, I'm sure you've seen that's I, I know when I go out to schools and I often ask the kids how many of you play video games, and it's like you know how how often do your parents you know get upset that you're playing video games? I said we need to change that paradigm because people are all upset about it. It's what video games they're playing and getting them engaged and understanding that there is a lot of educational component to that as well as entrepreneurship and all, all of the things that you identified. So wanted to give 
George Mason a plug on that, and I know they get out there in the elementary schools too. Um, I now will recognize um, Mr. Foster for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Consock, uh, and also for letting me sit in uh, on the committee today, which I normally do not uh, serve on, but I very much appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm Bill Foster. I'm best known as being the uh, only PhD scientist in Congress, and um, but I'm also the only integrated circuit designer, um, which uh, and uh, and. In addition to that, I'm a businessman who started a tech company uh, with my brother in our basement that uh, now manufactures the majority of theater lighting equipment in the United States. And we just went over a thousand employees and, and we've had continual trouble uh, hiring people with appropriate technical skills. And one of the really important um, factors in that is, uh, is a government commitment to, to high quality education period. Uh, which unfortunately has become a matter of some uh, dispute. Um, we, we operate in Wisconsin where the, um, the legislature and the governor um, has you know, acted in a very strong way to, um, in, against the interests of uh, the University of Wisconsin, where I graduated from. It's resulted in a hemorrhaging of, of faculty from that institution and um, a, lot of, um, a lot of uncertainty about whether there's a commitment to high quality education. And that um, has real economic implications. I was discussing recently with my brother who has been running the company for a long time um, about whether under these circumstances he would, uh, he would consider um, developing that business in Wisconsin anymore uh, simply because of the damage that's been done to the education system. So it is important to, to preserve this um, and I hope there is a bipartisan uh, commitment to that. Um, I, I also am the co-chair of the New Democrats uh, Committee on the Future of the Workforce, which is why I'm uh, you know, so interested in this hearing. And the question I have is, um, within the fast-paced economy, the fast-moving technical changes in our economy, how do you aim for the jobs that will actually be there? five years from now, you know, there, and particularly in terms of the breadth of knowledge you shoot for. Uh, you can, you know, if you say, okay, we're going to have cell phones in our future, you can teach people about the mathematics behind the quantum mechanics, behind the logic gate design, behind the computer uh, logic design, behind the programming, behind the, the you know, the um, app design, and on and on. There's, and you have to educate people at an appropriate level. You know, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of Micron as a company, but the number of integrated circuit designers in our economy will never be large, okay? And, and so that you can't, you know, that's not the job of the future for the majority of people. Um, and I think, you know, I worry that, for example, a few years ago or a decade ago, we made probably a mistake treating, you know, training a whole generation of people to be web designers and learn HTML. If you're a web designer today, you don't use HTML, you use high-level tools that are comparable to maintaining your Facebook page. And so you can, and similarly, big data analytics that you talked about will probably take place a decade and now having a conversation with Alexa, um, and you won't even be writing the, the code that does this. The giant AIs will do it for you and the cloud will do the computing. And so trying to understand how you you know, how you target this um, in terms of the altitude um, and, and particularly the danger that you, you train someone for a very narrow discipline uh, that will be vanished by the time. And so I was just wondering how you think about that problem because I know I worry about it all the time. Anyone wants to grab it? So the, a number of states got together in 2015 uh, to create the K-12 computer science framework. And what it does is it, uh, it it, did, it laid out, it codified, what are the essential basics that every citizen needs to know when it comes to computer science. These are the essential concepts. These aren't things that disappear in five or 10 or, or even 15 or 20 years. These are uh, the things that have existed over the last 50 years in computing and will continue to exist. So basically focusing on the core foundational concepts in this field, in the computing field is the way to go educationally so that students who are in kindergarten now who are getting super excited about computer science and what they're learning uh, don't uh, you know aren't aren't ill prepared when it comes when they get to the age of 22 and they're approaching the workforce so educationally we need to focus on the core concepts 
Maybe I could just jump in there too and say, I mean, for us, this is very, very core to what we do as a university. And of course, you're going to get a major, but into some specific subject area, but it's going to change no matter what. So we definitely have not succeeded if we haven't somehow enabled somebody to um, be able to have deeper skills that allow them to learn new things and to be engaged. Having said that, and, and, and to your point about STEAM, uh, a lot of that involves uh, having uh, uh, embedded into the education the idea of creativity and, and of imagination. That has to be a part of it, certainly. But um, I will say that we're also finding that the demand on our campus for people to come back multiple times during their life for a period of time, not for four years and not for $130,000, but, but to come back for a period of time, uh, the demand for that is just um, off scale. We almost can't meet it right now. And so we're spending a lot of time trying to think through, can we make a commitment to somebody that comes as an undergraduate that they'll be able to come back to our campus uh, a certain number of times during their life as they're at points where their careers are transitioning and changing, and then we can help uh, to serve them again. And I, I think that's probably something that we will end up doing. Mm -hmm. And it appears my time has expired, so I'll yield back. Oh, thank you. Okay, I guess we are at our completed time here. Thank you so much for, first of all, for all the great work that you're doing out there and highlighting these issues and helping illuminate these both for us but also for all our companies who are engaged, all of our communities and teachers who are engaged. So as the wife of a math and computer science teacher, as the mom of a... Uh, uh, biology and forensics uh, major. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And I think what is clear here is we all need to be lifelong learners in this field because this is going to continue to change. This needs to be incorporated everywhere from preschool through all of our lifelong you know, training and retraining and upgrading of our skills. So I think you've really helped um, illuminate this issue that will be um, an ongoing issue for our time. So I thank you and uh, the members for their questions and the record will remain open for two weeks for additional written comments and written questions from the members. And the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>